Hello, everyone, and welcome to Literary Tales. I'm your host, Paul Kraus, and in this episode, we're exploring the philosophy of politics, love, and redemption in the drama of William Shakespeare. Shakespeare cannot be separated from the context and times in which he lived. This should be commonplace and well-known and simply commonsensical to anyone reading the great plays of Shakespeare, especially his war plays. In 1588, Spain, with the blessing of papal sanction, attempted to conquer England through claims of inheritance and marriage, tying the Habsburg dynasty to the crown and throne of Albion. The Spanish Armada was defeated, and a world historical shift occurred. The New World was no longer going to be the sole domain of the Spanish Habsburgs, as it was at the time, but now was open to the eventual Anglo-Saxon and Anglo-Celtic peoples, who would bring Protestantism, common law, and the militia tradition of the right to bear arms to the Americas, eventually giving birth to the United States and Canada. Henry V was written about a decade after those tumultuous events that preoccupied early modern English civilization. The play may have been about one of England's most beloved kings, but a very close inspection of the play reveals that it is not simply a memoriam to Henry V, but a drama concerning the politics of usurpation and war, the throes of which England had just been under. Elizabethan anxieties and fears over legitimacy, succession, and religious sanction for conquest are all present in the play. The chorus might ask us to imagine the fields of Agincourt, since they were incapable of reproducing such a spectacle on stage, Oh, for a muse of fire that would ascend the brightest heaven of invention, a kingdom for a stage, princes to act, and monarchs to behold the swelling scene. But the movement of Henry V was certainly drawn from recent memories and experiences, not distant medieval ones. It is interesting to note, as other Shakespeare scholars of the past have, that there is much irony interwoven into a play about one of England's most celebrated monarchs. Then should warlike Harry, like himself, assume the port of Mars, and at his heels, leashed in like hounds, should famine, sword, and fire crouch for employment. The choral introduction to Henry V, the chorus sings, the chorus sings that Henry will bring not peace, prosperity, and fertility's blessing, but that he will assume the port of Mars and bring famine, sword, and fire to the world. If the measure of a good ruler is presiding over hearth and home with a hearty fire and a good stew, then Henry is no such king. The play opens with the bishops of Canterbury and Eli fretting over a possible church tax. This reflects the angst and anxiety of the clergy in the turmoil of the Reformation. Fearing the loss of their established customs, the churchmen assume the role of conjuring up a justification for war against France, which has long been on the mind of the good King Henry. When Henry gathers with the bishops and they exchange the necessary pleasantries, Henry asks the Archbishop of Canterbury to explain why he has claims to the throne of France. Sure, we thank you, my learned Lord, we pray you proceed, and justly and religiously unfold why the law salic that, have, that they have in France should or should not bar us in our claim. The Archbishop then gives a long and tedious and banal speech about the technicalities of Salic law in what is one of the most boring and snoozeworthy speeches in all the great plays of Shakespeare. And that's actually the point. The archbishop conjures up the most technical, bordering on absurd pretexts for war. The audience, and we as readers, immediately 
latch on to the absurdities. But perhaps the most important is when he tells Henry that Salic law forbids a woman from, in, from ever inheriting the throne. No woman shall succeed in Salic land. And of course, in the aftermath of the reign of Queen Elizabeth, this would strike an English audience as patently absurd and something that no good Englishman would ever endorse. The speech by the Archbishop reveals the ambiguity and the blending of recent English history with that medieval memory. The Archbishop is analogous to the Bishop of Rome, conjuring up the justification for war and regime change. No woman shall succeed in Salic lands, evokes the complexity and the interweaving of women, Salic exceptionalism, and religious blessing that was the Spanish Armada and the Habsburg attempt to overthrow a certain Queen of England, as we've just mentioned. Accepting the Archbishop, Archbishop's justification, Henry prepares to awake the sleeping sword of war that will disturb the tranquility of the vineyards and gardens of the world, the pleasantries that make life worth living. After mustering a small invasion force, Henry proceeds to venture deep into Frankish lands to establish his claim to the throne. There is only one image of fruitfulness in this play. At the very beginning, when the Bishop of Eli speaks to the Archbishop of Canterbury, that the strawberry grows underneath the nettle and wholesome berries thrive and ripen, be and ripen best. This tranquil image of serenity will soon be replaced by blood and mud. We must remember and never forget that famine, sword, and fire is what Henry unleashes over the course of the play. It is true that Henry V includes some of the most sublime and memorable of Shakespearean rhetoric. Once more unto the breach, dear friends, and cry God for Harry England and St. George are among the most recognizable lines of all Shakespeare. But we shouldn't let the beautiful and moving rhetoric Shakespeare inserts into Henry's persona distract us from the irony that also lies within those same speeches. In the same once more speech that opens the third act of the play, Henry says, somewhat revealingly and often forgotten, let us swear that you are worth your bleeding, which I doubt not. The value of a man is not in husbandry, it is in war, only war, in bludgeoning a fellow man to death. That is where a man's worth is found. Shakespeare is actually telling you in between the lines, no it's not especially considering how this play actually ends. The St. Crispin's Day speech continues to unveil this hypermasculine fraud of war. As Henry raises the spirit of the beleaguered and hungry English army, he extols the reality that they are few in number, and therefore that a victory would mean more glory to the happy few. While the other men who remain home in England with wife and children will be forgotten, those who are actually worth their breeding, those who are with their family, those who have ventured with Harry into France for battle will be remembered for all eternity. Why will they be remembered for all eternity? Not for the love that they showed to a family, but the slaughter and the massacring of the French army. They will be remembered not for love, but for their brutality. Again, one should be able to see the ironic satire that Shakespeare is presenting us in between the lines. The mark of a man's pride and immortality won on this St. Crispin's day will be the scars he shows the younger generation and his age-old peers who sat out the battle. This, of course, this is the great masculine fraud unveiled by Shakespeare, war in all of its supposed honor and glory is not really the highest reality of life. Love, as Shakespeare will show us, 
by the end of this play is what the true blessedness that humanity seeks should pursue and realize in life, just as Henry V does in his wooing and eventual marriage of Catherine. When the French ambassador had arrived earlier in the play to taunt Henry with tennis balls, during which Henry assured him that he would not kill the messenger, as it were, we are told that Henry is a pious and good Christian king. We are no tyrant, but a Christian king, unto whose grace our passion is as subject as our wretches fettered in our prisons. Here we again find more irony and satire in the intrusion and the intrusion of the Anglo-Spanish War into this play. Henry declares himself a Christian king, but in comparison to what? A non-Christian king? Of course, that was the argument that Philip II made against Elizabeth, and therefore gave him justification for declaring war on a non-Christian queen. Henry's declaration of being a just and graceful king, implying the virtue of Christian mercy and compassion, is immediately juxtaposed with wretches fettered in our prisons. An image of tyranny, prisons, is placed side by side with the claim of not being a tyrant. The attentive audience and the close reader should be able to undress this juxtaposition. War unleashes the barbarism of Henry, as it does any man more generally, and this is fully manifested as Henry conquers town after town. How yet resolves the governor of the town, he asks a besieged French garrison. This is the latest parley we will admit, therefore to our best mercy give yourselves, or like men proud of destruction, defy us to our worst, for as I am a soldier, a name that in my thoughts become me best. If I begin the battery once again, I will not leave the half-achieved Harfleur till her ashes she lie bury. The gates of mercy shall be all shut up, and the fleshed soldier, rough and hard of heart, in liberty of bloody hand shall range, which conscience wide as hell, mowing like grass, your fresh fair virgins and your flowering infants. In this remarkable speech by Henry to the French townsmen, we see the nakedness of his warring pathos. So much for cry God for Harry England and St. George and the heroism of once more unto the breach, dear friends. He specifically says that he is going to shut the gates of mercy, that he will kill, kill all the women and the children within the town, defy us to our worst. So much for the merciful and graceful Christian king he had proclaimed himself to be earlier in the play. Once you realize that Shakespeare is giving us a juxtaposition between war and love, you can understand why the play ends, not with the victory of conquest, but through a loving marriage. The other side of Harry, the human side, is when he is with Catherine. War, Shakespeare is telling us, especially in the name of political conquest, regime change as we like to call it today, barbarizes us. It causes the worst demons to be unleashed from our soul. Love, or at least the hope of love, by contrast, humanizes us. After winning the improbable victory at Agincourt, much like the English winning against the much larger Spanish fleet in the English Channel just a decade before the premiere of Henry V on stage, we begin to see a different Henry as he courts his bride, as the drama moves from war to love. The war acts the third and the fourth, give closer inspection to the person of Henry than the first and second acts. His psychology is revealed as we learn his anxieties over his tenuous and fragile rule inherited by his father and from his stark brutalism in threatening to wipe out entire villages 
and their non-combatant populations. This, of course, was the same problem that Queen Elizabeth was suffering when, see, when she ascended to the throne and was dealing with the complexities and the problems of the religious reformation, as well as war, on her doorstep. But in the final act, with Princess Kate, Henry is metamorphosized into a more tender, compassionate, and wholesome individual. No longer beset by the lust to seize the French crown, no longer beset by the lust to destroy French armies, and instead intent on winning the graceful heart and affection of a woman, Henry lets go of his imperial ambitions to rise into the flower of the white rose instead. The meeting of Henry and Kate face to face as subject creatures of love brings the peace that the chorus was hoping for in the prologue to Act Three. The bravado of Henry is humbled by the fairness of Catherine. He is brought low by falling in love with her, as she reminds us when she speaks to him in ironic French closure that she is the reason for Henry's being. The Henry of the sword, whom we nakedly see revealed to us in Acts 3 and 4 in complete brutality, despite the beautiful rhetoric and the heroic, rousing speeches he gives his men, is transfigured by his encounter with love in Act 5. The bloodthirsty and brutal Henry of war suddenly becomes a love-struck young man, unable to speak those rousing words he gave to his men. O oh, fair Catherine, if you will love me soundly with your French heart, I will be glad to hear you confess it, brokenly, with your English tongue. An angel is like you, Kate, and you are like an angel. While Kate is confused and blushing, manifesting signs of life and fertility, rather than the other image of red in the cheeks, dead, bloody men, Henry doesn't mince words about his affection for her. Henry offers no great speech here, no unto the breach, no cry God for Harry, no band of brothers can be conjured up out of the love-struck heart and tongue of the king. I know no way to mince it in love, but to directly say, I love you. There are, then, upon close inspection, two Henrys in this play. There is the Henry of the sword and the Henry of love. The more endearing, indeed transfigured ruler is the Henry of love. Given that we have just seen the bloody mess of Agincourt, the, en the ending of Henry V is hopeful in its closure in marriage. The prospects of prosperity and life are returned to us after having just witnessed bloodshed, conquest, and destruction. Prepare we for our marriage, on which day my lord, lord Burgundy will take your oath, and all the peers for surety of our leagues. Then shall I swear to Kate and you to me, and may our oaths well kept and prosperous be. As the chorus closes in the play, we are reminded that Henry lost France. He lost the throne. He caused England to bleed, but he found salvation in Catherine. What Shakespeare is presenting us through the play of Henry V is how the war, the politics of war, brings out barbarism, death, and destruction. But out of that barbarism, death, and destruction is the new life found in marriage and the prospects of a family. And that is also what we find in that other great war play, Richard III. This other great Shakespearean drama also deals with regime change. One of the earlier historical plays that Shakespeare wrote, Richard III is nonetheless a masterpiece of the Shakespearean canon. And just like Henry V, it deals with this juxtaposition 
of the politics of conquest and war and how it leads to death and destruction vis-a-vis the hope found in marriage which brings stability, life, and love. What makes Richard III such a shocking play is how it showcases the extent to which a person will go to seize and hold power. Richard III wishes to prove himself a villain, he openly says it, and that he will murder anyone to achieve that goal. He completes the reality of how the pursuit of power makes us a villain, causes us to lose all morality, causes us to forsake our friends and family. Like the good black operation that Richard III's usurpation of power has to be, he hires expendable third-party executioners instead of getting his own hands dirty. Plausible deniability. He must appear clean, like modern presidents and secretaries of state must appear clean to the masses, even though behind the scenes they are often engaged in dark, dastardly deeds. Furthermore, Richard has totally and forsaken the reality of love in his life. Shakespeare is telling us that the pursuit of political power and the eventual embrace of war to hold power destroys our ability to love. His courting and marrying of Lady Anne exposes the hollowness of his own affection, as the marriage is for purely political ends. Richard nonetheless feigns repentance and forgiveness like any good two-faced politician. But his marriage with Lady Anne is purely for show. It only serves a political purpose. The audience and the readers of the play recognize this almost immediately. Furthermore, murder, killing, is how Richard ascends to the throne, and murder is how Richard attempts to maintain his power. Because his power was achieved through death and destruction, he only knows power through death and destruction. Like Cain, Richard is a fugitive of the law he is meant to uphold for others, but bends and distorts it for his own purposes. Richard's descent into paranoid madness ends, of course, the only way it could possibly end, with more murder. Buckingham, an erstwhile champion of Richard, sees himself on the way out, like Soviet lieutenants during the Great Purge. No amount of loyal service can protect one from the vain insanity of a man who has sold everything to usurp and hold on to power. When one has embraced power f purely for power's sake, Everything he touches turns to death and destruction. Alienation and loneliness sets in. Richard's regime change ends in civil war. During the Battle of Bosworth Field, when Richard cries that infamous line, A horse, a horse, my kingdom for a horse, we realize just how fragile political power actually is. For all the power and state infrastructure, Richard had at his disposal, from his ascent to his fall, a simple horse was all he cried out for, when it was all vanishing away in blood and fire. Richard III is also the scourge over England for having deposed Richard II in another regime change prior to his murdering to power. A long train of abuses and tragedy befalls England for having committed the first act of regime change prior to Richard's life, which leads to the culmination of his brutal politics of backstabbing, murder, and civil war dramatized in the play. What is born of blood must end in blood. What is born of fire must end in fire. The pursuit of politics of power inevitably leads to war which leads to death and destruction. Lastly, we also see, as briefly mentioned earlier, just how isolated, lonely, and alienated Richard becomes over the course of the play through his pursuit of power. True, in some sense, he was always isolated in a certain manner to begin with, but he was a scheming man 
with grandiose intentions at the beginning of the play, and he spoke to the audience as if having a relational conversation with us. Moreover, the veil was not yet cut, so he still had to curry favor with his mother, his family, and his friends. They are by his side, even as Richard begins his slow descent into madness. However, as the play develops, and as Richard seizes power and falls into greater insanity and madness, all of his former confidants, family members, and supporters desert him or die, sometimes even killed by Richard himself. The endearing but cunning asides inserted into the beginning of the play in which Richard is talking to us as the audience begin to fade away. Richard is now an empty shell of a man, alone, deprived of family and friends, and even the audience. There is no more love in Richard's life. Civil War, first and foremost, is associated with political usurpation in the play. Richard's pursuit of power, his usurpation of power, culminates not in dark dungeons and chained cell rooms, but in a war that rips England apart and kills many of its great men and women. Neighbor fights neighbor, brother fights brother, the sacred bond of family and land evaporate as the sword of war rears its ugly head. Richard's death is met by that recurring image of Shakespeare, love in marriage. Richmond's Mary marriage to Lady Elizabeth signifies the rebirth of war-torn England. How fitting it is that the rebirth of a shattered nation is in holy matrimony with the prospects of a fertile womb giving birth to new life and a family that will restore the destruction, the death, and the fire that the entire nation has been reeling with because of the pursuit of power which has led to civil war. What Shakespeare so brilliantly reveals in Henry V and Richard III is the horror of war wrought by political power, the pursuit of political power, as well as political usurpation. Shakespeare lived through the turmoil of attempted regime change and civil war. Shakespeare's adolescence and youthful maturation was during the final days and the aftermath of the saga of Mary, Queen of Scots. The prime of his life intertwined with the Habsburg attempt to overthrow Elizabeth I and claim England for the Habsburg Empire, not to mention the Elizabethan police state critiqued in Hamlet, which revealed how bleak politics and paranoia also chase away love. We see in a close inspection of Shakespearean themes and ironies through Henry V and Richard III that these very concerns of the Elizabethan age are brought forth on the stage as great dramas, and we also learn what Shakespeare is telling us about the drama of politics and love. The pursuit of politics leads to war, death, and destruction. It destroys families. It destroys farms. It destroys entire cities and towns. It is nothing to be considered honorable or even glorifying. Shakespeare undresses the false propaganda of war as something heroic. He shows it as something terrible. It brings distrust, deceit, murder, hanging, scars, death, destruction, and famine. The sword of war unleashed in the lust for power, manifesting itself in political usurpation, makes villains of us all and awakens the hounds of famine, sword, and fire to sweep over the fair and plentiful world we inhabit, leaving it bleak, dark, and destroyed. But in that darkness and destruction, the true wisdom of Shakespeare is found in his exposing the naked horror of war wrought by the pursuit of political power and how it cannot be countered by more political calculation, more political scheming, but through the encounter and flourishing of love and how love transforms even the worst of killers into the gentlest of lovers who can bring life into the world as it was with Henry 
and Catherine. Like all great poets whose theme is love, and unlike all political theorists and activists whose being is the pursuit of power, Shakespeare reminds us of what truly matters in life. The Henry of the Sword is not much better than Richard III upon close inspection, especially when we see the barbarous Henry of Acts 1, 2, 3, and 4 of his play. But the Henry of Love is still an open option for those sorry souls who have dwelled in blood and mud. But they will have to lose France. They will have to lose political power if they are to gain better angels to whom they will love and have a family and find true meaning in life. Shakespeare heals the world destroyed by politics, not with a political solution, but a far more human and interior solution, the power of love.